Hey everyone, it's Ali, and today I want to talk about Delve. This is a video that I wanted to make for quite a few leaks now, and I'm finally happy that I get a chance to make it. What I want to talk about today is going to be everything relevant to Delve. I want to talk about builds, the Delve meta, how to Delve itself, the profits, and more importantly, why I think Delve is amazing and why you should try it yourself. So why don't we talk about that first? What actually is Delving? So Delving can basically be considered its own game mode. You know how Heist effectively is like its own little thing and it doesn't really interact with the rest of the game outside of you maybe sometimes seeing contracts and sometimes seeing smuggler stashes in your maps? Well, Delve is effectively the same thing. The only relevant thing about delve and mapping is simply just collecting the resource that you need to delve, which is sulfite. Outside of that, delve is its own ecosystem contained within itself that has its own meta, its own build, its own scaling, its own difficulty, its own end game. It is beautiful. In my opinion, it is my most favorite mechanic in the game. It's something that I think every single person should at least try once. The reason I like delving so much is just because of the infinite scaling that Delve provides. Delve is going to be the single hardest piece of content in the game. It's going to scale to the point where even just normal, tiny little white monsters are going to have more health than uber bosses do late game. Delve is also going to be so much harder and do so much more damage to you that it's going to make a map look like an absolute piece of cake. What I really enjoy about all this is that if you want to truly experience a boss fight, if you want to experience something where you don't immediately just one shot an uber boss and you actually need to do mechanics and you're going to actually have a multiple minute long fight, something that's very difficult to experience in PoE due to all the power creep, you can actually experience that in Delve because the bosses in Delve are actually difficult and you actually need to do the mechanics properly for them. Otherwise, you are going to start failing them as they go deeper and deeper into the mines. The other thing that I like here is that upgrades actually feel meaningful for your character, unlike in mapping. If you were to take a build with maybe a mage blood and 100, 200 diff put into it, a pretty end game build, that is going to be strong enough to basically face roll through all mapping content, no matter how difficult it is, and pretty much face roll through most bosses, assuming the builds can actually do bossing and it's not some sort of squishy mapper. But the point is, if I were to take one of those builds and give it 20, 30% more damage, you're not going to really notice it. I might kill monsters a frame quicker in a map and I might kill a boss maybe half a second faster, but it's not noticeable and it's basically meaningless. The same really goes for a tank build. If I take a multi hundred div build that's already pretty tanky and make it more tanky, I'm not going to really notice it. I might notice I, I might die a little bit less here and there or my health might stay a little bit higher at most times, but it's just not enough to really make any meaningful difference. The point is past a few hundred div into your character, you really don't have much of a reason to keep going other than bragging. For example, mirror items are basically completely overkill and you'll never actually see any sort of return on your investment in terms of mapping unless you're buying some sort of mirror item that gives you an insane amount of clear, such as an explodey bow or something. Well, the thing is, none of that is true in Delve. In Delve, since all the content infinitely scales, actually adding an additional 20, 30 million DPS to an already 100 million DPS build will actually feel impactful. And you will actually notice yourself doing 20, 30 million more DPS because the monsters in Delve will eventually scale all the way up to 2 billion health. Assuming you are doing a depth that is relevant for your build and you're not doing something super high where you're already one-shotting things anyways, those upgrades do matter. And the same goes for tankiness upgrades. In Delve, you need to be tanky. Delve is not for squishy characters, and after a few hundred depths, squishy characters are going to struggle to make any more progress because they're going to take so much damage in here. With that said, most builds can very comfortably delve all the way up to a thousand to maybe a thousand and a half depth, one depending on the build and two depending on how min-max it is. But past that, you are going to need to play a delve build. And what I really like about the delve builds is that they are amazing builds for literally all content. That means these builds are going to be amazing bossers because you have to kill monsters that have two billion health in the first place. They're going to be amazing face tankers because again, you have to tank white monsters that are literally harder than super juice monsters in a super end game map. At the same time, a lot of these builds can just be made a little bit squishier or made to do a little bit less damage and just have a lot of clear added to them, making them pretty decent mappers as well. A Dell build all around is just a really nice all arounder character that can pretty much do all contents relatively easy. And because of all that, it's why I've fallen in love with Delve. I love having a reason to keep upgrading my builds. And I like that all the relevant super deep delving builds are typically just very good characters for the whole game. What I want to cover next is going to be two very important concepts. First is going to be the delve scaling and second is going to be the chance for you to see different biomes. So as you can see here, POE database, and I'll link this in the description below, has a chart of the monster life and the monster damage in delve at every single depth level up to 6,000. As we can see, the monster life and monster damage don't really scale that fast, but as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the mines, as you can see, the health of and damage of the monster is going to scale very quickly. As you can see, it's something like one and a half thousand 
10,000 or so, monsters are going to have around 144% more life and do 10,000% more damage. This is why most builds are going to get capped at around one to one half thousand, just because you're simply not going to be tanky enough to deal with 9,000% more monster damage. The other thing to mention as well is as you go even deeper and deeper and deeper, the monsters are going to have so much health that somewhere around this point, monsters are going to have HP cap, meaning they're going to have 2 billion health. Not only does that mean that you're going to have to deal with monsters doing 30,000% more damage, you're going to basically have to kill monsters that have 2 billion health each, which is going to take a little bit of time, meaning that at this point, only deep delvers are going to really be able to make any more progress. The other thing I want to mention is this other chart of biome chance. So this is not a linear chart. As you can see, it very quickly ramps up to 501 and a half thousand. But what I want to bring your attention to is these three lines over here at the end. In Delve, there are three biomes that are rare to see, and those are going to be the three different cities, the Vol Outpost, the Abyssal City, and the Primeval Ruins. And as you can see, the closer you get to one and a half thousand depth, the higher your likeliness of seeing one of these biomes when a new biome is generated. As you can see, they kind of teeter off at around three. 350, which is why 300 350 farming is really profitable as your chance to see cities is high. But this scaling is also why going a bit deeper is also a good idea. Not only are you going to make more profit from the other nodes in Delve, but as you get to 500 and even 750, your chances for primeval ruins is the highest which we really care about as the boss of the primeval ruins all is where a lot of your currency is going to come from as all of his drops are typically very expensive. Realistically, just pick whichever depth is comfortable for you. But if you can, you do want to go deeper. And this is why you do want to actually go a little bit deeper for horizontal farming. Now, the next thing I want to mention is actually the experience that you get in Delve. You actually gain a decent amount of experience and you can realistically hit level 100 in Delve if you are farming at a proper level. Obviously, if you're going to keep going down, the game is going to get harder and harder and harder, which means you're going to die more often. And realistically, you're not going to hit 100 by deep delving unless you're already playing a deep delver, which are builds are effectively immortal. But if you're farming at, let's say, 300, 350, you can reasonably see yourself hit level 100 in a few days of delving. That's because there's a lot of rare monsters and a lot of magic monsters in delving. And delving actually used to be the strategy in solo self on hardcore to race to 100. They actually ended up nerfing delving a little bit because of this, but the XP is still really good and you can get to a fairly high level pretty quickly. If you are going to do something like 500 or 700 horizontal farming instead, you're going to need to be a little bit tankier, but you can realistically see yourself get to level 100 in those brackets as well. Next up, I want to talk about the kind of builds that you want to play in Delve. Delve has its own requirements and its own meta for delving. As I shown earlier in the scaling portion, the damage of everything in Delve becomes kind of crazy. And because of that, you need to have a very tanky build. Typically, the requirements to be able to deep delve are things such as physical to elemental conversion, because typically most delve builds use a keystone called transcendence, which makes all armor applied to elemental damage reduction, meaning that you would take a big hit, it would get DR'd by your resistances. So for example, if you had 90% fire resistance and you took 1000 damage, it would be damage reduction down to 100 damage. And then again, it would have to be damage reduction by armor again, bringing that hit of 100 maybe down to anywhere between 5 or 6, meaning that we could take a hit of a thousand and instead of a thousand damage we only take five or six damage and with delve doing 30 000, 40 000 percent more monster damage you are going to have to turn a hit of a thousand into a hit of five or six just to actually be able to live in super high delve so transcendence and physical damage to elemental conversion is very popular. You're not going to have to do transcendence until you are thousands of depth down. That typically is going to be the thing that stops most builds from being deep delvers is because they simply can't fit transcendence into their build or they can't fit a lot of physical to elemental. There's a lot of other good ways of living in delve as well. Some people are choosing to live by stacking elusive effect and stacking law of evasion and just simply dodging. But in basically all builds, and especially if you want to push to a thousand and a thousand five hundred and beyond, you are going to need to have high armor, high evasion, crit damage reduction, and as close to 90% all res as you can possibly get. There's other things that are also really nice to have in Delve, such as a big health pool, having progenesis, having high regen, having spell suppression, having block chance, having things such as Sapphire, Topaz, and Ruby Flask because they have less elemental damage taken on them. And the thing that is basically required, no matter what, even if you can't stack max res, even if you can't stack physical conversion, is going to be a mage blood. Anything 
past a thousand depth, or if you aspire to get to a thousand depth or lower, is going to require a mage blood to actually make it work, as mage blood and a enkindling orbed sapphire, topaz, and ruby flask become mandatory portions of delve to actually be able to live that far down. There is simply no way of getting around that. Mage blood and 90% increase effect elemental flasks are a hard requirement. I do want to quickly point out that obviously there's going to be some builds that don't run mage blood or that can't fit a mage blood into their build. But if you aren't playing one of the deep delvers that are making it work without a mage blood and you're just playing just a typical build, you most likely are going to need to be able to incorporate a mage blood into your build to make a non deep delver or a build that's specifically designed for delving to work at very low depths. That isn't that bad of a requirement because delve is so profitable and we'll talk about this after we talk about all the builds that you on average getting down to a thousand depth make enough money to actually buy a mage blood. And even if you don't, you could go up and do 300, 500, or 700 horizontal farming. And in a day or two of doing horizontal farming at those different depths, you will make enough money to be able to purchase yourself a mage blood. That's a really nice thing about delve in general is that you can make enough money while delving to keep upgrading yourself and to keep up with delving. It's not just a challenge for the sake of having a difficult challenge, but it's also a way to be able to basically SSF your upgrades in terms of being able to make money while also doing difficult and scaling content. Delve very much feels like a road leg because of that, because you can continuously upgrade yourself as you do the content and you can keep up with the scaling and potentially even beat it making your build feel better and better and better now what i want to go over next is going to be all of the different types of deep delving builds that are possible currently all the builds that we're about to go over are going to be builds that are basically designed to delve these are going to be builds that are going to be able to go very deep and they're not going to struggle as much getting to a thousand a thousand five hundred and they're going to be able to comfortably go past a thousand a thousand five hundred and they're going to have the potential to be able to go past a thousand and a thousand and a half now if you ever want to look at any delve builds yourself all you have to do is just come to poe ninja go to the build section and then sort the ladder from experience to depth and then you'll be able to see all the people currently on the ladder that are making some sort of meaningful progress in delve now there's not going to be everyone in delve because some people have their profiles private, so we can't unfortunately look what they're doing. But this is every single current public profile on the Delve ladder. So you can always come here and look for inspiration. Every build I'm about to mention as well, in the description below, there will be a link to that build specific POE Ninja. So for example, there will be a link specifically for all the bone chatters if you'd like to look at the bone chatters. I'd highly recommend for you to look at these and use this as inspiration if you want to play a deep delver yourself. So first off, we're going to talk about all the builds that in my opinion are very easy to get into. If you don't have much money or if you don't know if you want to play delve and you are looking for a somewhat cheap build to put together or a very simple to play build to see if you'd like to play a deep delver and if you want to go further deep delving these three builds are going to be the ones i recommend the first off by far the easiest and one of the most reliable and this build has literally been a deep delver since the inception of the skill is going to be bone chatter now there's going to be a few ways for you to put bone chatter together the cheapest and the easiest one is going to be the two-handed weapon and this will get you pretty far in delving unfortunately this is not going to be tanky enough and around a thousand to a thousand and a half you're going to start struggling and what you're going to want to eventually do is to transition into the one handed and shield version of bone chatter this version of it is going to stack a lot of physical taken as elemental and it's going to eventually at super super high levels incorporate a transcendence to be able to live the damage of deep delving now the one-handed and shield version of it is going to be a lot more expensive to put together and it's not something you're going to have to do until you start going to a thousand thousand and a half and beyond but you could also start with this although it's going to be a little bit more pricey in my opinion getting a good two-hander is going to be substantially easier because the requirements on a good one-hander is going to be substantially higher but both versions are good and if you enjoy bone chatter, you can do bone chatter. A final thing to mention about bone chatter is going to be the super, super high end version of bone chatter. And this is going to be the fire version with Nebulox. Now, in my opinion, both this and the normal physical one-hander and shield bone chatter are kind of as good as each other. I would say the Nebulock version does start pulling a little bit ahead, especially at higher budget levels. And this would eventually be what I would recommend everyone to eventually transition out of once you do make a lot of money playing one-handed and shield, as this should be able to push all the way up to four or 5,000 depth with absolutely no problem. It'll just tear through all the content, but this will be a little bit more expensive to get going. Now, if you don't want to play bone chatter, my other recommendation for a very cheap build to get your foot in the door as a deep delver especially one that you can upgrade over a long period of time are going to be one of the two mana stacking builds so we have mana bond which plays very much like cast and crit we're going to be cycloning all over the place and you're going to have a mjolnir triggering a bunch of mana bonds which is going to be six linked through a squire and it's going to be where most of your damage comes from while at the same time stacking insane amounts of energy shield and insane amounts of mana mana bond is super cheap to put together and this build is just Beautiful. I have a whole build guide on it. It is a few leagues old. If you want more up to detail information on this, I will link Connor's channel in the description below, which does 
keep an updated mana bond set up, especially one for Delve. And this is a very tried and tested build that will guarantee to do well. Now, another option instead of playing this with Mjolnir is to do this with a bow instead. This is personally what I'm playing in Delve right now. And I have a whole build guide on it, which I'll link in the description below as well. And in my opinion, I would say this is a little bit better than mana bond just because we've proven that this build can be put together for a very cheap price. That's typically why people don't play this build until much higher budget levels, because most people are just playing mana bond. Since most of the items for mana bond are very much one-to-one -to, -one to exactly the items you want for the bow version of the build. But typically people think this build is a lot more expensive and a lot harder to put together. But it's the build I've been playing all the B-roll that you see in this video, and it can be put together for very cheap and because of that, I would personally recommend to play this over the Mana Bond version of the build. No matter what, both Bone Chatter, Mana Bond, and the Bow version of Mana Bond are going to all be very strong Delvers. And if you don't have much money, these are the builds that I highly recommend you do to get your foot in there. Now, if you have a little bit more money, instead, what I'd recommend is to potentially do armor stacking. Armor stacking is going to basically require you to have a mage blood. There's no way around it. It's going to be way too weak of a build without mage blood. And this has always been a very fun build, not only just for delving, but for mapping in general. It's a very good all-arounder that can do all content just fine. And it's a very fun build to put together and it's a very fun build to play. The core concept of this build is just stack a lot of armor. This does not actually show you how much armor this build has. This path of building should have somewhere around one and a half million armor instead of about 600,000. And the whole point of it is you're using a replica dream feather to turn all that armor into raw attack damage while also stacking a lot of aura effect through inspiration to get a lot of flat damage from a smite, which is going to make your smite do a lot of damage. It's a very fun build to put a lot of money into, but again, it's not a build that you can go into without a lot of money to start with. And there's a few versions of this. Some people are playing this on Scion, which is a typical standard version of this build but some people are also playing as chieftain and this has a few ways of being put together you can do this as molten strike and you can do this as a variant where you go chaos damage as original sin but that's going to be substantially more expensive to put together another thing to mention as well about the sign version of it is sign can also go molten strike but that's going to be something that you're going to be doing much later on and as an armor stacking sign you are going to have to swap over to a molten strike version by the time you reach around 1.2 1.3k as even a multi-mirror smite version of the build is not going to be able to keep going as a multi-mirror molten strike version of the build can but the chieftain version is also another option if you want to play an armor stacker. But again, this is going to be very expensive. Now at the extreme high end, and in my opinion, this is the single best build in Delve. I don't think anything comes anywhere close to this. In my opinion, it's just probably one of the best builds in the game in general right now. This build is really strong and it can basically do everything. If you want a really good mapper, it's a really good mapper. If you want a build that you can open an uber boss with, leave your character there to get smacked, go to bed, wake up, go to work, make some food, come back to the game and still see your character live, this is that character. This character is truly the definition of immortality. There is actually nothing in the game that can kill this thing at all, period. This build is, in my opinion, just stupid. And because of that, I think this is the best deep delver in the game. This is a Eye of Winter build that is chaos converted through Original Sin. It is heavily abusing Flask to stay alive. This build is not cheap to start by any means. Original Sin is mandatory to realistically play this. And the gear that this specific path of building has is absolutely crazy. And you're going to need something at least somewhat close to this gear to really make this build feel good. But this build will do hundreds of millions of DPS while also not caring about a single monster in the game. And if you had to choose a build as your super end game build to play in Delve, this is what I'd recommend. But again, the price point of starting this build is around a mirror or two. If you want to know more about it, I will link a channel in the description below that goes into super high detail about playing this build if you'd like to know more information. Lastly, what I want to mention is the current rank one profile in Affliction. This is Turd Twister and he is playing a Strength Stacker in Delve. Now this is an anomaly. This is a massive anomaly. Strength Stacker is typically very, very squishy, but Turd Twister has managed to actually turn strength stacker into a very very tanky build he is doing this by fitting in a progenesis as well as three elemental flasks to set up as well as stacking elusive effect max block chance and a lot of grace to make this build actually incredibly tanky and make it a viable deep delver strength stacker is just a great build in general has amazing clearance of wonderful builds to throw lots of money into but by no means is this build cheap by no means do you want to start a strength stacker for anything less than a mirror i would not personally recommend this as a deep delver as this is not something that's super proven in Delve, but currently this league, Turd Twister is very much showcasing that he is dominating the whole ladder with a strength stacker, giving this build a lot of legitimacy as a very strong deep delver as well. And this could potentially be something you might be interested in, especially if you just want a good build for everything else. Now, finally, the last honorable mention I want to give is two corpse explosion builds. Now, typically in the past, 
Formation has been a absolute S tier deep delver, but unfortunately, Formation has been kind of deleted from the game in Affliction. Because of that, the next best option is to play DD instead. DD is still going to be very strong, especially this league in Affliction where we have some really powerful corpses, and DD will still do a great job in delve while also being able to make it pretty deep. It's not going to be 5k viable anymore like it was in the past, but this is still a very strong build overall, and it's very much a build that can very easily still get to two to 3,000 depth with no problems. If you like to play DD, if you like a corpse explosion build in general, and it's just a good build in general for all content in the game. With all of that out of the way, why don't we start talking about the Atlas tree that you'd want to be running if you do plan to do some delving. So delving doesn't benefit from the Atlas tree itself, but what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to get more sulfites, the resource we need to actually delve, meaning we don't have to spend as much time in our maps and we can get back to delving as soon as possible whenever we do run out of sulfate. So this tree is going to be very simple. The only thing that we really care about here is going to be adding as much quantity to our maps as possible. That's why we're going to be picking up all the quantity nodes in the middle of the tree, as well as the two slants at the top of the tree for more map modifier effect. That modifier effect means that all of the mods in our maps are going to be a lot higher, which means our map is going to overall have more quant, which is going to directly impact how much sulfa you get from each of the little nodes that you click on a Nico mission. Other than that, all we really need to add on here are the two delve nodes that are relevant. We're going to be picking up mining byproducts as well as all the tiny nodes since it gives us more sulfite, as well as picking up packed with energy. This is just going to give us movement speed, meaning we can pick up our nodes a lot faster. Guarded hordes, which gives us a 5% chance to get double sulfite, as well as the monsters around the sulfite nodes giving themselves a few hundred sulfite as well. And then really nice thing about mining byproducts is it's not only going to give you a lot of money, as every time this procs, you're going to get anywhere between half a div to a div worth of azurite, but as as you go into Delve for your first time and as you're buying all of the upgrades, since Delve does have permanent upgrades, kind of like a roguelike, this every time it procs is going to give you a lot of extra azurite somewhere between three to five thousand depending on how much sulfate you got meaning you're going to get those upgrades a lot faster which is going to make you progress and delve just a little bit easier the rest of our tree is just going to be focused on either picking up things that are going to increase our map sustain give us a little bit of passive income to offset our mapping costs since this is going to cost a little bit to get our sulfites or just make it faster so we're going to pick up all these shrine nodes this is going to feel great because with synchronism you have a really high chance to see an acceleration shrine every map which means you can get your sulfate a little bit faster and get out a little bit sooner as well as picking up covetous shrines which if we do find one on our maps it's going to give us increased quantity meaning for all the sulfite nodes that we click for the rest of the map we're going to get just a little bit more quant meaning we get a little bit more sulfite lastly we are going to be adding in red altars as we aren't really caring about the map we're just simply killing monsters through the map just to get flash charges to pick up our nodes a little bit faster so just adding in at least one type of altar is going to allow you to at least farm invitations very slowly which pretty much mostly pay for your mapping costs by themselves. We're going to take bat fires by fire just because we want to get those invitations a little bit faster. And this on average will save you two maps per invitation. The rest of your points, and you don't need 132 points for this, just simply remove some of the map duplication points on here. But the rest of them are going to just go into a lot of map duplication to make our maps seem a little bit easier, as well as the three shaping nodes on the tree, the two at the bottom of the tree, as well as the one at the top of the tree. With all this and a decent amount of map duplication nodes, you should be able to over sustain your maps. And currently, tier 16 maps sell for anywhere between 8 to 10 chaos, and that's true for most leagues, meaning you can make a little bit of profit just bulk selling maps once you have a really big bulk of them. Now, in terms of the setup for your maps themselves, it's actually very, very simple and it only takes you maybe a few minutes to set up 100, 200 maps, which are going to be enough to last you a few days of delving. So all we're going to want to do for our maps is chisel all of them for quality, which is going to give us more quant, as well as just elk them and then regex them for any mods that we can't do. This website called poe.re, which will be linked in the description below, allows you to set up a custom regex for mods you can't do. This is going to be something you're going to have to change based on what build you're playing. For example, my build, I can't do Ellie Reflect, I can't do Regen. I just select basically all the mods that my builds just get bricked by. And what you could do is you can click the copy button, come into POE and paste this into your highlight items in your stash. And everything that isn't lit up means it's a map that has a bad mod on it, making this really easy to reroll. But all you want to do is just simply alk your maps. And ideally, if you want to min-max this a little bit more, you could reroll your maps until they're 75 or 80% quant or higher, which might be nice, especially if you really don't want to spend more time in your maps and you really just want to keep delving. But it's not really a hard requirement. To accompany our maps, all we need is just going to be a sulfate scarab. I'd really recommend to write a Gilded Scarab because this on average should save you one extra map in terms of the maps required to hit a full sulfite bar as well as them just being really cheap because delving isn't 
super popular most of the time, meaning you can pick these up for cheap and they're going to be better than polished and rusted because they give you 60% more sulfite. Now, obviously you can just use rusted or polished and it's up to you. Just pick whichever scarab you can afford with your current budget and just use those. But ideally, eventually you would want to use gilded as these are very cheap and they save you a lot of time. The company are scarabs. We want to add in three sacrifice pieces. These are very cheap and you can typically most leagues buy them for 200 to 300 per div, which means you have two to 300 maps of sacrifice pieces of a given kind. And you want to get yourself three different ones as each different sacrifice piece we put in our map is just going to get consumed and give us 5% increased quantity. That means if we use three different pieces, we get 15% increased quantity, which is just more sulfite, meaning we are going to save more time not having to do as many maps for each sulfite bar that we get. The tree for all this will be linked in the description below, as well as POE regex if you do want to make a regex for yourself. Up next, let's start talking about delve itself. So what I want to first discuss is just how to delve in general. So there's going to be two popular strategies that you're going to want to do. You're either going to want to go down a little bit and then start going horizontal at a depth that feels comfortable for you, or you're going to want to deep delve. And deep delve effectively just means just to keep going down until you can't keep going down anymore. Obviously, some builds are going to be able to go infinitely, meaning that the scaling of delve is outpaced by their gear or is matched by their gear, meaning they have no limits to how far they can go. But typically for most builds that aren't deep delvers, you are going to cap somewhere around 1000 to 1500 depth as the absolute maximum your build's going to go before you start struggling a lot. That's also going to be a build by build thing. Obviously not all builds are going to go to one and a half thousand and not all builds are going to only go to a thousand, but somewhere within that bracket is typically where most non deep delvers get stuck. Now, obviously if you do decide to deep delve, what I would then recommend if your build really can't go any further, or if you do just want to make money and you want to keep delving is to instead do horizontal farming. Now there's quite a lot of different variations of horizontal farming, a very popular level to go horizontal at, which has shown quite a lot of of promise is to go horizontal at anywhere between 300 to 350. 300, 350 should be extremely easy for most builds. And you'll be able to see quite a lot of delve bosses, a lot of rare fossils, and the amount of Azurite they get from Azurite nodes is pretty decent. You can expect to make quite a lot of money at that point. And typically most leagues at 300, 350, you should be able to make enough money to buy a mage blood in about two to three days of delving at that point. But obviously if your build can handle more, and if you feel if you're up for a challenge, you should go a little bit deeper before going horizontal. Personally, what I'd recommend for most non-deep delvers is to instead go all the way to 700 to 750 and do some horizontal farming at that point. Another more general piece of advice I can give for horizontal farming is to instead just go as deep as you can. And once you start struggling, go up maybe 100 to 150 depth and go horizontal at that point. 100, 150 depth from the point where you're struggling should feel very comfortable. It shouldn't really have too much of a difficulty doing the content at that point. One thing that I do want to warn you about if you are going to do horizontal delving at anything below 300, 350 is the bosses are going to get exponentially harder very quickly, meaning that your build might not actually be able to handle the bosses. And if you can't kill the bosses, you should go up a little bit higher as the bosses are about half the profit that you make while delving. Meaning if you can't kill them, you are massively gimping yourself in terms of profitability. Now, one final thing I want to mention here about different delving styles is an old strategy that just is not good anymore, which was hunting for walls in the darkness to farm a lot of fossils. Not only has fossil crafting been nerfed, meaning that fossils are a lot less in demand than they used to be, but darkness farming and fossil farming in general have also just been heavily nerfed in terms of the amount of fossils that you see. Not only that, but currently, Delve is the third best way to get fossils in the game. Currently, both Simulacrums and Legions are both substantially better in terms of just giving you a large amount of random fossils. If you really are looking for fossils, I'd recommend to do one of those two things instead of Delving. The only fossils that are relevant from Delve are the Delve exclusive fossils that are not available anywhere else, which we'll talk about more later in the video. So before we begin our adventures in delving, what I want to first talk about is going to be the Voltraxic Generator. This is going to be something that's going to be at the top of the mines, and this is going to effectively give you a roguelike experience in delve. This is going to offer you a bunch of different things that you can upgrade, and these are going to be permanent upgrades for all characters in a given league. There is going to be a certain order in which you want to upgrade these, in my opinion, and I just want to quickly discuss it. The first thing I want to mention is do not upgrade your darkness resistance. It is completely useless, and it's just going to be a massive waste of your Azerite. The reason behind this being is that flares are just better than upgrading darkness resistance. As you can see, my current light radius, if I were to upgrade again, would cost 3000 azurite. If my darkness resistance was at a comparable level, it would effectively also cost the same amount. And if we just look at the cost of a flare, we can see that it's 
five. That means if I were to upgrade my darkness distance once, and this is something I'm going to have to permanently upkeep the deeper I go, it effectively means I wasted the Azerite equivalent of thousands of flares. And the thing is, the flares are just as good as darkness resistance. When you drop a flare on the ground, it's going to provide a little bit of light around it. And this just immediately stops any sort of darkness damage you take, meaning that having darkness resistance is completely pointless. If you ever find yourself in the darkness, which is any area that's not around the cart, you are going to start taking damage very quickly. And the darkness resistance is going to reduce the rate at which you degen from it. And because flares are just so cheap, you should just never bother with it. Now, in terms of how you want to go about upgrading all these, what I'd recommend is to first start with your sulfide capacity. It's going to take you until somewhere around 600 to 700 depth to fully upgrade your sulfide capacity. I really recommend fully upgrading it because it's just going to make getting your sulfide feel a little bit better. You're not going to have to leave your delve as often to go get more. And it's only going to just give you massive quality of life which in my opinion, I feel is really important. Other than that, you are going to have to continuously upkeep your light radius. The further down you go and delve, the smaller your light radius is going to be. You need to keep upgrading it to keep up with it. Now, you don't need to go for 150, which is the maximum amount. If I were to upgrade this again, it wouldn't do anything, but... This means it'd stay at 150% for a little bit longer as I keep going down, meaning I wouldn't have to touch it for a little bit longer. Now, you don't need to keep this at exactly 150. You can let this wane down, but I would recommend to not let it go past 60 to 70% because at that point, the light radius becomes a little bit too small. It's going to feel a little bit bad, especially the cart light radius, which is the one at the top, as if your light radius is a little bit too small, actually are going to have darkness seep in on some of the nodes, meaning you won't be able to hit some of the monsters in their naturally spawned positions, which is going to feel a little bit bad and you might have to use flares. After you finish your sulfide capacity and as you're keeping up your light radius, what I'd recommend next is to upgrade your flares. Before you actually cap your capacity, I'd recommend to go up to maybe 10 or 11 flares as having that many flares, especially on the bosses, is going to feel really, really good. You don't need many of these while you're pathing and you're doing nodes, but on bosses, having as many flares as possible is going to feel really, really nice. I'd also upgrade the duration a little bit. You don't have to go and cap it to 24 immediately, but just getting to about 20% not only is cheap, but it's also going to feel really nice. Once your capacity is fully upgraded though, I I would recommend as your next thing to do to cap your duration immediately to 24 seconds and to work on getting all of your flares. This can go up to 21 different flares. And in my opinion, I personally like it, but you don't have to if you feel like 17, 18 flares is enough for you. Lastly, once your flares are fully upgraded, you are going to want to upgrade your dynamite. This is going to be very cheap to actually fully max out. And it's going to be very relevant for one very specific node. Now, if you're going to stay at something like 350 or 500 or 700, you don't really need the dynamite. But if you're going to try to push a thousand and deeper, and especially if you're going to play a deep delver, you absolutely need to have your dynamite upgraded for the rogue exile node as there is one monster in the rogue exile node that will effectively just one shot you and what we want to do with the dynamites is we want to spam them because every time they explode they will do a stun in the explosion radius meaning we can effectively perma stun a monster with nine different dynamites and hopefully kill it before that stun wears off so we don't actually get one shot by it one final little thing that i want to mention about both flares and dynamite is you don't have to spam click the craft button what you could do is if you instead shift click and if you shift click click, you will craft as many as you can up to your cap. But once you have finished buying upgrades, or once you feel you're good with all the upgrades that you have, the rest of our Azerite is simply going to go into Nico. Nico is actually a vendor and he sells three different types of resonators. And the ones that we're going to be interested in are going to be the one socket tiny resonators for 300 Azerite each. This is going to be where somewhere around 30 to 40% of your profits in Delve are going to come from, as resonators are worth a lot of money as they're using crafting. Currently, they're worth about one div to 70 resonators, meaning that for every 15,000 Azerite you collect, you make about a divine. Right? So going to change every league but they typically tend to stick around 70 to 80 resonators per div which means anywhere between 15 to 18 thousand azurite is worth a div so now that we've gotten our atlas tree out of the way now that we've talked about the upgrades let's talk about delving itself so delving is going to be very simple you are simply just going to be going node to node and you can only complete each node once once you have it completed you'll never be able to go do it again but you can branch out from that node in any direction that you want inside of delve as you can see there's many different colored patches of background and these are going to be the different biomes that you can see as you can see we'll have magma fissures we'll have sulfur vents we'll have frozen hollows we'll have petrified forests we'll have fungal caverns and we will have abyssal depths. Not only that, we will also have all the different cities and you will know it's a city because the background will be different from everything else. And the cities will also have this yellow border around it, making it very easy to tell where each city is in Delve. These are going to be a little bit rare, but as I talked about 
previously in the video, these do become more and more common the further down you go into Delft. All these different biomes are going to have their own different layouts and their own different ways to path through them. And they are going to have different nodes that are exclusive to different biome types. What I want to say about this is none of it really matters except for Petrified Forest. Petrified Forest, in my opinion, is a massive pain in the ass to actually get through. And I would really recommend to do whatever you can to just avoid this biome at all costs. Obviously, if you have to path through it, you should and you shouldn't do a big detour just to avoid it. But if you can, if you have the choice to either go maybe left through a petrified forest area or go right through not petrified forest, I would always recommend to do that. The reason behind this being is just the area within petrified forests and the pathing to get from one node to another. It's just really annoying. There's a lot of really tiny roots everywhere and it's kind of annoying to tell where you're actually going, where the cart's going to go. And you tend to get stuck a lot on all of the different doorways and it's just not fun. I would just recommend to skip that bottom at all costs. Now, speaking of all the different nodes, there are a few nodes that you actually really, really, really want to do and are going to be crucial to your profitability. The first thing I want to talk about are going to be the fossil nodes. These red looking balls are the fossil nodes that we are interested in, and they specifically say it contains fossils. Now, there's going to be two different types. First, you're going to have one that is just called Smuggler Stash. If you see a fossil node that says Smuggler Stash, you just ignore it. This is nothing special. But if you see a fossil node that specifically says anything but Smuggler Stash, so for example, this one says Crystal Spire, that means this fossil node is going to have one of the rare Delve exclusive fossils that cannot be obtained from any other piece of content except Delve itself. And these are going to become more and more common the further down you go. As you can see on this screen right here, I have a Crystal Spire, I have a Haunted Tomb, which is the rare node for the Fungal Forest, and we have a Stonewood Hollow. So here we have three nodes within one screen. If you were to go substantially further up, here we're about at 660, you'll maybe see one every screen or two. But the further down you go, the more common they become. And they basically are like little pieces of candy everywhere. In the description below, there will be a list. So you don't have to remember what I'm about to say of all the different ones that you want to go for. But the ones that you're going to be interested in are going to be the Crystal Spire from Abyssal Depths. These are going to give you hollow fossils and these are typically worth somewhere around a quarter to half a div, depending on the league. Human fissures in the sulfur vents, these are going to give you fractured fossils and these are also worth anywhere between a third to half a div each, depending on what things are splittable and how popular expedition is in any given league. Molten cavities in magma fissures, which are going to give you facet fossils and these are basically always in high demand, especially a week into the league as these are used to make high-end items. And time loss caverns, which are found in the frozen hollows. These give you the glyphic fossils, which are going to give a random corrupted essence modifier. These are usually not worth as much, especially now that RF has been nerfed. So the popularity of RF helmets has gone down. But in my opinion, these are still worth going for. Now, there are going to be two rare fossil nodes that you should not bother with no matter what. The first one is going to be the Haunted Tomb in Fungal Caverns. This node isn't bad, and if you have to path through it, that's fine. But what the Haunted Tomb is going to give you is going to be a Tangled Fossils, and these are typically just not worth anything. Currently, these fossils are worth about 3 chaos, and the most they'll ever be worth is somewhere around 10 chaos. These overall just aren't used in anything, so you can just simply ignore these and not bother about them. The other node to mention is going to be the Stonewood Hollow in Petrified Forest. Now, not only are the fossils from this, the bloodstained fossils, pretty much worthless and are really not used for anything other than some niche gem crafting here and there, but this node is also basically the second or third hardest node in Delve. What I'd really recommend, if you don't believe me, is go try one of these at 600, 700, 800 depth, and you will just see just how stupid these nodes are. Basically, this node just throws a bunch of rare monsters at you, and if they have some really bad Arch Nemesis modifiers, you can just get clapped in half a second, and they're not very fun. Not only do they take very long, but their fossil's not worth anything and they're just very difficult to do and they're very easy to fail. So I would skip these at all costs. Again, all this will be in the description below. So you don't have to remember exactly what I said in the video. And if you want a written down version of all this, you can find that there. Now, the rare fossil nodes are not the only nodes that are worth actually bothering with. As you can see, throughout Delve, a bunch of these nodes are going to give you different words. For example, this one's going to be currency. This one's going to give you gems. This one's going to give you armor. All of these are not worth bothering with and you can completely ignore them. The only other nodes actually worth bothering with are going to be the ones with unique icons that specifically say are going to give you items of a specific type. So for example, you can see here, this one says contains lining items. This one contains mana or curse items. Effectively, what these do is they're going to give you a bunch of rare items that have something related to that on it. So for example, this contains lining items, Restless Rubble is most likely going to have a conductivity on hit ring. If you are delving at the start of a league, these curse on hit rings could be worth quite a lot of money, especially if you get a really well rolled curse on hit item. But at the same time, you also get a decent amount 
amount of fossils, but you might also see a few items that might be worth a div or two here and there. The other really important node, and this is so important that I'd recommend for you to always do this every time you see it, are going to be the ones that specifically say contains minion or aura items. These are going to have this green looking skull, some goop around it, and the bases that you can get from this node can be worth tens and tens of divs, if not up to a mirror, just for a singular base item. The three main items that you're looking from this node are going to be ES helmets with physical damage taken as chaos damage, chest plates with plus one specters on them, and rings with life reservation efficiency of skills on it. Now, all three of these nodes can very rarely sometimes drop as fractured. And if you get one that is fractured, it's automatically worth quite a lot of money. But typically for the life reservation efficiency of skills rolls, they are only worth much if they're on an amethyst ring base and if they have high mana, high intelligence, high ES, chaos resistance, or any other useful stats for mana builds. Otherwise, these are typically not used too much. So these are very hit and miss and you're going to see quite a lot of them. As for the plus one Spectre chest plates, typically you want to get one of these on an ES base. If it's not an ES base, it's not going to be worth too much. Some armor ES bases are also going to be pretty good, but evasion bases are typically not going to be worth much. But as you can see here, even just an occultist vestment can be worth a few div if it comes with decent stats on them. Sometimes people buy these just to attempt to fracture themselves to potentially get a fractured plus one Spectre, which they can then craft from there. And if you get super lucky and get yourself a Vol Regilia, a Vol Regilia is guaranteed to be a few divs for even a failed fractured base and can even be worth even more if you do have a non-fractured one for people to buy. Lastly, we have the physical taken as chaos damage helmets. Now these, as you can see here, if you end up finding one on a hubris, is effectively worth a mirror. This is going to always be true no matter what, even if it's not fractured, because with the new Hinocora's locks, we can effectively guarantee we can force the fracture on the mod that we want by just spamming the helmet with enough Hinakura's locks to get the one in four chance for the physical as chaos to be converted. Now, it doesn't have to be specifically hubris. If you look, for example, at a Solaris circuit, you can see that even a slightly weaker ES helmet is going to be worth a lot of money. These are something that you really want to be on the lookout for. And you can sometimes sell high evasion, such as lion's pelts or high armor bases with this for quite a lot of money. But typically the most profitable and the one that people are typically going to want are going to be the hubris circuits as these are used for quite a lot of different deep delvers as they need this 10% physical as chaos to fully convert converts all of their physical damage to anything but physical. So always make sure you go out of your way to do these nodes. Now, obviously, if one of these is really far away and there's not a nice way to path to it, don't bother. But if it's something like this where you'll need to go three nodes out of your way to get it, then you should definitely go for it as the chances of you making a lot of money is going to be very high. What I mean super out of your way, for example, would be pretend this haunted tomb was the minion and aura node. This would kind of take forever to get to as you'd have to path this way and this way. And then it would basically take you five minutes to get to it. And the chances for these bases aren't super high. So going this big of a trek to go get this node isn't worth it. But if it's only a few nodes, if it's, for example, something like this, where this would be the minion and aura node, you should definitely go out of your way to go get this. And finally, to finish our discussion on the nodes that are worth bothering with are going to be the special nodes in the three different cities. Now, in every single one of these cities, pretty much all the nodes are going to look like this. They're going to be a themed box for the city. So, for example, it's going to be an abyss looking box in the abyss cities. But sometimes in the cities and the further down you go and delve, the more common these will be, you will see a boss and it'll say contains unknown. In the abyss cities, it'll be the lich's tomb and it'll have this little green skull icon. In the vault outposts, it'll be the grand architect's temple and it'll have this black circle with a golden thing in the front and a red outline. And in the primeval ruins, it'll be the Crystal King's throne. Now, unfortunately, I do not have one of these that I haven't done. And I attempted to look for one for a few hours, but I couldn't find one. But the way this icon looks is a black wolf looking mask with a blue outline. And it's very easy to spot as it's just going to be the thing that doesn't look like a blue chest, but that is going to contain all. Now, out of these three bosses, just do not bother doing liches. Liches are 100% not worth your time. The drops from liches are just worth nothing. And nobody really wants any of the unique items from the liches for any of the current popular builds. But with that said, the other two bosses are 100% worth your time doing. And if you see one, even if it's kind of annoying to get to, for example, if I were to see a architect in this vault outpost as I was pathing by, I would 100% make my way up to kill it because the expected value of killing these bosses is incredibly high. The drops that we're going to care about from all are going to be the topaz rings that he rarely drops, the crown of the tyrants that he drops pretty commonly, and the onyx amulets, all's uprising that he drops maybe about 25% of the time. Now, 
Out of these drops, the ring is typically worth the least amount, but in some leagues, it can be worth a lot of money. For example, in this league, this ring is currently worth about three to four div. The reason these rings are expensive is because you can combine them together in a vendor recipe to create a ring based on the color of the ring. So for example, if I vendored three blue rings, I would create a power charge ring that would have power charge based mods on them. And those are typically high end items that people are on the lookout for and typically like to gamble. The helmet, Crown of the Tyrant, is a popular helmet and is the best in slot helmet typically on animated guardian setups. These are pretty volatile. Some leagues, they can be worth an astronomical amount of money. As you can see here, it's 9, 10, 11 div. And some leagues, they can only be worth 2 to 3 div, but they're still a pretty decent profit. And lastly, the amulet, All's Uprising, is something you can either identify and it's going to have a random mod on it that's going to make a aura free, or you can sell them unidentified like this and people will buy them just like Watcher's Eyes just to identify them themselves and to gamble on hoping to hit a big ticket one. Typically, the one that's worth the most amount of money and the reason that these are worth so much identified is the Envy Has No Reservation version. Now, there are going to be a few other ones here and there that are worth a lot. Typically, sometimes Haste or Wrath or Purity of Elements can be worth a decent amount as well. But most of the costs and the reason these are so expensive is because the Envy one. And Envy has no reservation at all is uprising is best in slot for Poison SRS, which is a very popular build nowadays, meaning that the price of this amulet has shot all the way the roof. But in my opinion, based on IDing quite a lot of these, in most leagues, you are effectively breaking even between IDing these and selling them an ID'd. If you were to ID, let's say 30, 40 of these, you'll pretty much have made the same amount of money as if you sold 30 to 40 of these an ID'd. So in my opinion, just don't identify them and just sell them unidentified as that's going to be consistent money versus you gambling. You can gamble and you could potentially get lucky and get multiple NVs, but you could also get multiple clarity or vitality or precision ones, which are worth 10 C instead of the multiple divs that an unidentified one is. Now, as for the architect and the reason the architect is worth doing is because it drops a ball aspect. Now, he will drop this aspect about 25% of the time. And in the past, this was used to make the tower over deals, which allowed you to fight the trial master. But nowadays, this has been reworked to be combined together into a new unique item called the adorned. People will end up buying these and they are worth quite a lot of money because this is another form of gambling and this is an item that's been quite popular in some builds. And if you end up getting a high roll of the Adorn, it can be worth a very large portion of a mirror. But these will drop somewhat frequently from the architects. And as you can see, they're typically worth quite a lot of money just because that jewel is very powerful. The other drop that we really care about from the architect is going to be the map that he sometimes drops, Doriani's Macamarium. Now, these are a little bit rare and their price is going to heavily fluctuate and heavily depend on the current league. The reason these are worth so much is because they are sometimes required as a map that is required to finish all the challenges in a given league. And if Doriani's is on the list of required maps to complete, Doriani's will be worth quite a lot of money as you can see here. But if Doriani's or the unique map challenge is not required for a given league, or if the league cosmetic rewards are not cool or something that people are desiring to get, the price of this is not going to really be worth that much. But as you can see in a league like this in Affliction, where it is a very much desirable item because the MTX set that they get for Affliction is a pretty cool looking one. It is going to skyrocket in price and it's going to be worth quite a lot of money. Between both the architect and all, on average, you can expect to get somewhere around four to five div of profit per boss that you kill. Now, obviously you can get bad luck and just get a drop from the bosses that is only worth 10 C, as I only mentioned the drops that are worth multiple divs. But most of the time you are going to see one of the multiple div items that I mentioned, meaning on average, they're worth quite a few div every time you see one of them, making them very, very efficient to farm. As you can see, as you get further in Delve, the rate at which they show up also does increase quite quite a bit. And you can see them very often. As you can see, I have one here. I had an alls over here as well. There's a Lich over here. There's an architect over here. There was another architect over here. And as we keep looking up a little bit more, you'll see that there's more bosses all over the place. There's a lich over there. There's probably an architect over there. There was an alls here. They pop up like candy. And the further down you go, the more common they become, making it very, very lucrative and very desirable to go as far down as you can because these bosses are worth a lot of money. Now, the final thing I want to talk about in this video is going to be the profits that you can expect from Delve. Now, one thing I want to say is that you cannot give Delve an exact div per hour. That's because it's a little bit inconsistent. In a given hour, I might find five or six different bosses and all of them could drop an item worth 10 div and I could make 40 to 50 div. In another hour, I could find no boss at all and not really make much money. With all that said, we can still somewhat estimate the amount of money that you should be expecting at a given depth level. And the money they can make from Delve is actually really, really strong. So typically most leagues, 
around one to one and a half thousand depth, you're going to be making about the same amount of money that a typical solo magic find player can make doing super juice mapping. Typically, that's around 20 div an hour or so, but obviously it's going to fluctuate a little bit and obviously it's going to depend on the league. Currently in Affliction, for example, solo magic find can make about 40 to 45 div an hour. But at the same time, because there's not many people delving, because so many people are mapping, all the items from delve have skyrocketed in price, meaning that deep delving at one to one and a half K, instead of it being about 20 div an hour, is probably around 30 to 35. It's not as much as solo magic finding, but obviously it's kind of hard to keep up with solo magic finding Affliction. But if this is a normal league, they basically would be neck and neck for profit per hour. Typically going past one and a half thousand depth is going to give you some of the best money possible in the game, but at the same time, it's going to be very difficult and you're going to need to play a deep delver. Now, if you want to look a little bit higher at around 300, 350, you can expect somewhere around 10 div an hour, which in my opinion is really good and solid money, especially since 3, 350 is really, really easy to do and you don't really need much to be able to do it. From there, going further down, it's going to scale pretty linearly. Around 500 and 750, you should expect somewhere around maybe 15 div an hour. And that should slowly scale all the way up to 1,000, 1,000 and a half. Realistically, from 300 to 1.5K, you expect a range of anywhere between 10 to 20 slash 25 div an hour. And you can just pick whichever depth you want between that to farm at. And the further down you go, the more money you should expect. In terms of where all the profits actually going to come from, it's going to be a pretty even split. About 30-ish percent of your money is going to come from resonators. And that percent is going to go up the further down you go. Because the further down in depth you go, the more azurite you're going to get from each of the azurite nodes. Making a tier 3 node somewhere around like 1,500 depth being worth about a third to half a div per tier 3 node. The next 30% or so is going to come from rare fossils. And those are also going to become more and more common the further down you go. And then finally, the last 30 to 50% is going to come from bosses. Now, the bosses, again, are going to be a little bit inconsistent because one hour you could find 10 alls and all 10 alls could give you an item that is worth 10 div. Or you can go multiple hours with no alls at all. The further down you go, the more common all the bosses will be. So your bad luck streaks will be substantially shorter. But at the same time, the further down you go, the harder these bosses will become. At over a thousand depth, I would say that all is harder than uber bosses by a mile. At the same time, the architect also becomes pretty rippy. And the further down you go, the harder these bosses will become. If you attempt to do a boss at around two to 3,000, you might have a multiple minute fight simply because they are going to have billions of health and they are going to one shot you. And eventually you are most likely going to have to play these bosses without getting hits, just like people did back in the old CHP meta. Overall, the profit's pretty strong in Delve. And it's really nice to me that you don't really have to sell too many items. You only have to sell resonators, which you can sell in bulk for a div at a time. You only have to sell four different rare fossils and you just have to sell some big boss drops here and there that you don't have to see too, too often. This is a strategy where you need to sell 30 different types of items. They need to use TFT to bulk sell and you might have items that linger around. Pretty much everything you get here will sell within maybe a few minutes of you posting it up on trade. The exception to that is going to be the rare fossils. It really depends if people are crafting. Obviously, if no one's making anything with the rare fossils, they're not going to really sell that fast. But typically, if someone is crafting something, they're probably going to buy a few hundred of the rare fossil, which means that a lot of the supply in the market is going to very quickly vanish. That's all I really have to say for this guide. I hope this answered basically every single question you have about Delve. If there's something I missed here, if there's something I didn't discuss, please feel free to leave a comment below the video and I'll be more than happy to help you with any questions you have. Other than that, I stream on Twitch every single day and I do try to delve pretty much every single league. I'm not a delver by trade. I don't do delving nonstop, but I am someone who does keep up with the Delve meta and I am someone who tries to be as knowledgeable as possible on it. And I do try to do at least a little bit of delving in every single given league. So if you do want to watch me do some delving, feel free to come by Twitch and see some delving for yourself. Or if you want to come hang out with the cuties, I'll be more than happy to see you there. If you're watching this video in a future league and you have any questions about delve, you're also more than free to come by and ask me any delve questions there as well. I'll be more than happy to stop what I'm doing and talk about delve as any excuse to talk about delve always makes me feel very happy. Other than that, I hope you cuties enjoyed and I hope to see you cuties in the next video.